Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about generative design research methodology, um, mainly the theoretical underpinnings of practice for systematic deduction and exploration in design. So that's my very first definition of generative design. I will go more into the uh, philosophical underpinnings and yes, this is uh, perhaps very early in the morning and philosophy sounds boring, but I really believe that uh, it's, it's a good idea to get some insight into the, the reasons why we do things and, and the, the, the connections between different methods is more important than the methods in isolation. So that's one of the other things that I'm going to touch upon. A little bit about myself. Uh, I have a hybrid background in uh, architecture and architectural design and practice and also uh, electrical engineering and in my PhD in design informatics I kind of connected both domains but one of my oldest interests in this field was methodology in, in particular research methodology and design methodology. So uh, because the whole uh, talk is going to be, I mean most of the things that I'm going to talk about are going to be rather abstract, I would prefer to start by examples. Uh, so if you <clears throat> talk about generative design in an engineering context, in the context of structural design and mechanics, uh, the, the meaning, perhaps the only meaning of generative design in those fields is topology optimization, which, it, which refers to processes for deriving a design mathematically by following the, the governing laws of physics, in this case, uh, structural mechanics, which is a branch of physics, and so, the idea of generative design here is to deduce or discover even design just by following the governing laws of physics that, uh, that uh, determine the performance of a system. So you actually start from the idea that uh, what should be the shape of a structure given uh, some optimality criteria or functionality um, definitions. Another example is uh, even when designing shapes, even if the shape is more or less given, uh, tessellations uh, of shapes are topological matters that can be handled by, com by computational generative design. And therefore, it can also be used in uh, generative design, can also be used in shape optimization. These are, by the way, some of the, the graduation topics that I'm proposing this year. So as Talia mentioned already, you can find them in the repository. So here I'm just focusing on what is the connection to generative design. So here you can see that different patterns are for the tessellation of these uh, shapes, these shells are, are explored and then the optimal ones are chosen. I will get back to this topic later. A similar idea, but also in connection to modular construction. Um, so the, the idea that you see here is a combinatorial explosion, uh, exp exploration. Uh, um, combinatorial as in combinatorics and permutations. So you have um, options uh, being explored uh, by not variating uh, geometric parameters, but rather by uh, changing the entire topology or the tessellation of shapes and in search for optimal tessellations that uh, provide optimal uh, functionalities. There's a, also a hybrid approach. Uh, I, I will put these things in a perspective. The hybrid approach, I, I call it the game-based approach, which is uh, actually a combination of the more mathematical approaches and the more uh, logical or grammatical, as in grammar, approaches. And that is uh, an, a relatively new direction that we have been pursuing in a couple of uh, research projects uh, on design games. That's uh, what I refer to as gamification of generative design. Again, uh, a more or less game-based approach, uh, which is uh, maybe in this case more mathematical. So the idea is to derive the design uh, only by starting from uh, required or desired functionalities, step-by-step step, deducing the design by means of uh, algorithms and, and mathematics. And so what you see here is, is a design project that, that looks uh, in a way ordinary or normal in every sense, but Everything you see here is derived by algorithms. So the entire shape of the building, the configuration. And so the idea is to, to dig layer and layer deeper in, into the project and 
everything is based on an explicit logical reasoning process that uh, you can verify and change if necessary. Or um, to, to give you a um, better idea of uh, generative design, I can also describe it as, as uh, design as scientific discovery. So in this case, we are kind of discovering the shape. How should be the shape of the building? In this case, the envelope of the building such that it um, um, provides equitable chances for the, the neighbors of the building to, to receive their, their, um, their right of daylight, for instance and or um, uh, finding out the design completely starting from a, a rather economical optimization where should we for instance place solar panels on an existing building in order to get maximum throughput from the solar panels without any more assumptions okay so um to th this was this was a series of uh, examples to to give you a more concrete idea from now on i'm going to going to the more abstract matters. But um, before I start doing that, let me uh, remind you of what I see as the important thing about architecture engineering. Uh, uh, it is the fact that as compared to other fields of engineering, we have to also deal with human factors and ergonomics. And so if you compare it to, uh, let's say mechanical engineering, the human factors and ergonomics are, are maybe present, but less present than in architecture engineering. And so this is one of the reasons we should be uh, a bit more into the philosophy of what we're doing. And the other reason that I, I, I touched upon briefly is that um, I, will, I will show you definitions and explanations. And the idea is that a research methodology is something more than just a, a collection of research methods. There, the structure that connects these research methods together is uh, even more important than those methods in isolation. So uh, the definitions I'm going to give you are obviously about generative design itself and design research, which is, a, which is an interdisciplinary field of uh, study about design and research methods for design and, and so on, and research methodology itself and design research method methodology. And to get there, I have to actually provide also some um, definitions, clarifications on what is design and what is science and how do they differ from each other. To, to get to this path, uh, I would like to first start with giving you an abstract or a definition. So I have a lot of text on these slides. As I said, I will provide the slides so you don't have to read everything. I, I, I will just uh, highlight the most important things. So how I see generative design is a uh, is a process is a is an umbrella term for referring to processes for grammatical meaning uh, grammar based or rule based mathematical computational or game based methodologies for systematic or methodical synthesis in the sense of exploration or itemization or deduction or derivation of plans configurations or forms and why we bother with these uh, methodologies is uh, the fact that uh, Generative design processes can be very transparent, very explicit in the sense of explicating the logical reasoning processes and therefore the, in the ethos of, of generative design, open science is key and mathematical transparency is, uh, is uh, uh, of paramount importance. And it's actually a process for kind of uh, design as scientific discovery and also participatory decision making, which is enabled by transparency, absolute transparency in the, in the process, and also explainable AI, the um, fact that you can not only uh, find solutions, but you can also explain the entire process of how you systematically get from A to B. And uh, they also, um, for reasons that, that uh, may actually go out of the scope of this presentation, uh, they also, um, help and, and also even suggest modularity and reproducibility of uh, both the methods and also the products. And uh, therefore, um, they can also contribute to, generative design processes can contribute to circularity and sustainability, and maybe even more importantly, quality of life with respect to ergonomics and human factors. And uh, because I'm, I'm talking about uh, design as scientific discovery, I will also um, linger a bit longer on the, the meaning of the so-called scientific method on a meta level and how it pertains to generative design. 
But um, before again getting more abstract, uh, let me let me um, clarify some of these terms. Uh, the definition I just gave you. Um, so as I said, uh, the design, generative design, um, I'm, I'm generalizing the concept to encompass uh, both the, 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 the engineering definition, which is about mathematical deduction and derivation, to also other approaches that have a relatively longer history in architectural design, which are based on generative grammars. I will, I will show examples more clearly, but uh, right now you just uh, need to focus on the fact that there are this is a kind of an umbrella term or a bundle name for grammatical methods, mathematical methods, and serious games for exploration, itemization, deduction, derivation of these kinds of products. Plans or in networks and graphs or configurations, layouts or topologies or forms, shapes, or geometries. And these terms are actually from different, um, let's say, domains. And in design, we probably prefer to talk about these kind of uh, terms and engineer, in engineering, these terms are probably more common. But in fact, there are uh, also known in mathematics as graphs, topologies, and geometries, from the most abstract uh, patterns to the most concrete patterns and shapes. Well, generative design, how, how does generative design uh, 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 position itself in, in the broader field of computational design? Computational design is an emergent field, uh, more or less. It has a history, relatively young history as compared to many other um, engineering uh, domains. Um, and throughout its history, it has also been um, influenced by the so-called design paradigms. There are, uh, these, are desi these design paradigms are in fact even older than, than computational design or maybe as old as computational design, but relatively the same age. There are two, let's say, worldviews. I will also uh, uh, go deeper into the meaning of the word paradigm. But for now, it, you can consider them as worldviews about uh, the philosophy of design. So there's a kind of a famous uh, way of looking or a worldview about design, which regards design as a reflective practice, as a reflective or creative practice, which can be learned through so-called tacit knowledge and experience. And I call that creative design. And there's a, a, the, the other paradigm of looking at design as a rational, as, a process, as processes for rational problem solving by Herbert Simon, um, which more closely fits the idea of generative design, which is basically about um, um, functional uh, derivation of designs um, rather than starting from preconceived ideas about shapes. We want to start from ideas of function. Uh, functionality and performance, and then step by step derive or deduce or explore um, design options. And therefore, um, long story short, uh, this is more about topology and combinatorics rather than geometry and, and variations in geometry. So, speaking of paradigms, you have probably heard many times people talking about the parad a paradigm shift in that domain or some other domain. So the idea of paradigm is loosely speaking about a scientific worldview, a, a, a system of um, assumptions or, or um, points of views about how things are or how things should be. And so if I ask you if uh, you see a duck or a rabbit in this picture, it's, your answer is probably dependent on the way you're looking at this picture. At the same time, this, uh, this creature can be a rabbit or a duck, depending how, on how you look at it. And, these paradigms uh, in particular exist where there, is, there are human factors involved and in humanities, they can even coexist at the same time. So that there are like competing worldviews about describing things. So it's not necessarily about which one is a better paradigm or which one is uh, um, correct. It's, uh, it can be also that the, the, they coexist at the same time. There's also another view about paradigms and actually maybe the word uh, paradigm in science actually got famous because of this book by Thomas Kuhn about the, the, the structure of scientific revolutions where he uh, talks about science in, uh, in the evolution of science in, in terms of um, endeavors for studying uh, or understanding nature. And <clears throat> first we have some kind of pre-science and then science gets to a point where uh, it is able to explain how things work and how things are. <clears throat> and then sometimes there are observations that do not match those uh, uh, previously defined models. And then 
that the, those crises kind of uh, trigger a revolution in science and then there is a paradigm change and we have a new cycle of development of scientific methods and models. Perhaps the most tangible or the most obvious example is the, the, the paradigm shifts in physics, the mother of all sciences. So uh, I've given these emblematic names, the Aristotelian or Newtonian or Einsteinian uh, science, science in the times of uh, um, Greek philosophers and polymaths such as Ptolemy, uh, Aristotle and Plato was um, considered almost a branch of theology or philosophy and there was uh, a kind of a duality of ideals and divine uh, ideal and divine forms and, and real forms. And then later on with the, with the um, so-called um, enlightenment movement and, and after Renaissance, the science was actually more or less about uh, coming up with uh, logical explanations for observations and justifications for observations. But later in the, in the modern era, mathematics and computation have been the main drivers of uh, scientific discovery. So uh, simulations and theoretical uh, explorations in, in mathematics have pushed the boundaries of science. And so observation is probably next rather than being first. So first you, you theoretically um, uh, propose something and then you test it with uh, uh, people or other people can, can test your Theory. So this is the, 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 the status quo or the state of the art of scientific paradigms right now. Um, as I said, I'm going to kind of dissect the, the generative design research methodology into uh, some parts. And now I'm talking about design research, which is kind of the, uh, the field that obviously pertains to um, this uh, business of generative design research methodology. If um, you look up for the meaning of the so-called design research as a field, it's, as I said, it's an interdisciplinary field that concerns itself with so-called design epistemology, how design knowledge is acquired. This is more or less a, a definition from the paradigm of Donald Schoen, the, uh, the description of design as a, as a reflective creative practice. But there's also a newer definition which is based on the physics based or mathematical notions of functionality or performance rather than the social ways of learning, the so-called tacit knowledge of design. But more or less it's about how do we ascertain that some design knowledge is valid. Epistemology is about validation of knowledge. And then there's design praxeology, the, the, the study of the, the actual practice of design or practice praxis of design. I will um, explain this later. And design phenomenology, which is more or less the, the study of the nature of design artifacts in terms of their, uh, their shapes or configurations. Um, and speaking of design research, uh, the, the whole course is about, in a way, research methodology. So I, I find it useful to also uh, dig a little bit deeper into the meaning of the word methodology. As I said, um, a methodology is something more than just a collection of methods. It's a structured collection of methods. And the way these methods are structured or connected to each other is uh, even more important than those methods in isolation. And so what distinguishes a research methodology from a collection of methods is the set of theoretical underpinnings. And that's why I'm bothering you with all these abstract matters today. There is um, maybe one of the most important reasons why we should bother with uh, research methodology and also, uh, let's say, its uh, sibling design methodology is the existence of the so-called logical leap in design. This, this was an idea that really triggered my mind long time ago to, to start thinking and, and researching design and research methodology, uh, which says that there is some kind of an inherent logical leap or logical jump in, the, in design processes. So someone comes to you and says, I, I want something to hit a nail with, and then uh, Tada, you give them a, a, a hammer, right? And the shape of that hammer is most probably, at least throughout the human history, has been more or less based on an intuition. So someone comes up with, a, with an abstract definition of a function, and then all of a sudden you give them a concrete form. And there sometimes seems to be a so-called logical leap or logical jump in design. And in a way, you can say uh, that generative design is an attempt to bridge this gap and make it a step-by-step -step reasoning process from the most abstract to the most concrete results. And speaking of research methods, um, 
well, research methods obviously pertain to um, practices of science, but um, contrary to uh, maybe the, the most uh, prevalent or common belief, there's not one kind of science. But when you say science, almost always you imply the so-called natural sciences, life sciences and physical sciences, which are about the studying how things change and how things are. But there is also a definition, a very uh, good definition of uh, the so-called sciences of the artificial by the same person, the Nobel laureate uh, Herbert Simon, who defined the design as rational problem solving, the so-called sciences of the artificial. These are, um, I would say, design sciences and optimization and engineering methods, operations research, uh, the fields that uh, are concerned with how to change things rather than how things change. So these are obviously uh, relevant to uh, so-called design sciences and more than being concerned with theories and hypotheses as to how things are or how things change, they are concerned with proposing methods uh, as to how we should change things and how, how should we come up with propositions for changing things. And in both cases, mathematics is, is used as a shared language of uh, exact sciences and therefore it is uh, emblematically referred to as the queen of sciences. But mathematics itself is not a uh, branch of science, but rather the language of science. Anyhow, so the distinction actually uh, between the so-called uh, sciences of the artificial and the sciences of the natural is also um, more importantly about uh, the, the non-conscious things or systems versus conscious beings which cannot be easily even called systems. I would call them conscious beings or humans or, or, or um, many animals, in fact. So the, the distinction is between a reason and a cause. So there's no reason for water boiling. It just boils when you, when you warm it up at a certain point. So looking for a reason for boi uh, water boiling is, is perhaps futile, whereas when you're talking about humans, so the, the, the behavior of um, natural things is, is uh, <clears throat> is governed by the so-called cause and effect laws, the laws of physics, in fact, but the behaviors of uh, conscious beings are, are governed by reasons or, or anticipations of future, which are posterior to the action, not prior to the action, but here causes prior to the action. So um, there is a very important definition of the so-called scientific method or the scientific method, which is kind of like a meta, um, meta level term describing procedures that are um, characterizing natural sciences, at least since the 17th century or the age of enlightenment, which are about systematic observation, measurement, experimentation, and formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses, right? And since at least 1970s, or maybe even you could, you could trace them back into <clears throat> the beginning of the, the uh, previous century, mathematical modeling and computational modeling have become increasingly more important in the formulation of these hypotheses. And also, as I said, in the so-called uh, sciences of the artificial, also propositions, formulations of uh, propositions. But uh, speaking of the word model uh, or, or the term modeling, I find it very important to distinguish a few things because I often see that people confuse modeling with lots of things, uh, including modeling for fashion. Um, but the word model, which is almost now depleted of uh, any specific meaning, uh, usually requires an adjective to, to, to make it more specific. So a model in, in science and in, in research methodology is actually a simplified replica of a system that is capable of partially mimicking the behavior of that system. And these models can be statistical models, which uh, are about fitting a model, a mathematical model, or a simple mathematical model to observe data. But statistical models, because this is such a large category of mathematical models, they're often um, separated from the rest of mathematical models. And mathematical models can, in this case, you have a model that looks like the model, a model of gravity, but, uh, but it's in fact used for models of trade or even movement of humans in space. Um, you can also make a physical model of something that is not physical. In this case, you have a physical computer in a way or a physical model of an economic system in a science museum in London, if I'm mistaken. 
or you have computational models, models that are mathematical in nature, but, but uh, can only, or can, can generally be uh, studied by means of computation and simulations. But the reason why we bother with modeling, because sometimes people ask me, I could have guessed uh, the, the result of this model, so why we bother with modeling? The reasons why we model are not only because we want to predict things or we want to um, um, optimize things. Sometimes we model things just to get a better understanding of the mechanism, to, to get to better explanations as to the structure or the mechanisms underpinning the behavior or the functionality of the system. We want to, uh, oftentimes we want to understand the dynamics, being able to understand the reasons for change and, and uh, also um, being, of course, able to predict uh, what will happen, which is, which is very important in engineering because before proposing a design, you want to see if your design will actually uh, improve the behavior of the system. So that implicitly or even explicitly means that you should be able to predict the dynamics of the model. And of course, we want to understand how things work to, to be able to design better things. And Oftentimes, what the things that we want to understand are rather complex, especially systems that involve humans in the loop. They're, they're, they could be very complex, and complex should not be mistaken with complicated. Complicated things are almost always complex, but complex systems are not necessarily complicated. What does that mean? So complicated are usually things related to humans and politics and so on, but complex systems are systems that involve um, Things like circular causality, uh, many feedback loops, combinations of um, different sorts of sophistications in, in, uh, in uh, emergent patterns and chaotic behavior in uh, uh, space or time and dynamics of the system. And complex, complexity sciences or, or complex models um, are interesting in the, in the study of uh, generative design because of these kinds of structures. So I'm, I'm going to give you two kind of archetypical examples of complexity. One is complexity uh, in complex, uh, complexity, physical complexity. Now you're looking at a so-called uh, termite cathedral. These termites, uh, little insects have, have built this so, uh, structure which in, if you compare it with our scale of life, it's kind of a skyscraper or a cathedral, which is a totally functional building, and it's actually an engineering marvel. If you look at the termites in isolation, they seem to be relatively even unintelligent beings, and yet it is really interesting how these relatively unintelligent uh, creatures can, can come up with such an engineering marvel. This is... Um, one theory is at least that they, they follow rules and they follow a structured set of rules and then by following these rules, they kind of create a generative system that generates this uh, engineering marvel. Another example, which is probably less pleasant, is, is uh, uh, an example that, uh, that involves complexity as in uh, human structures. Uh, so this is a, a very famous model of a city and how a city can, can become segregated if uh, the citizens of a city with maybe two prevalent uh, ethnic groups with the slightest preferences for having a neighbor of their own kind. They can, with their small actions, they can um, bring about an, the emergence of a completely segregated pattern in the city. Little by little, these actions can, can uh, bring about such a pattern. And the, the study of complexity has been the main focus of uh, the field of artificial intelligence since the beginnings. Um, so artificial intelligence was about uh, machines ability, is about uh, devising machines that have the ability to discern and map and decide in face of complexity and uncertainty. And maybe the uncertainty is even more important than complexity, at, uh, in, in, at least for, for design. Um, so fields of studies such as machine learning, machine vision, fuzzy logics, multi-agent systems, meta heuristics, and so on, are the branches of um, artificial intelligence that pertain to the study of complex systems that, and therefore they can also be used in generative design. So the, here I want to provide you with a compass for choosing research methods, uh, which is um, a distinction um, of research methods. Oftentimes I uh, hear that people are uh, caught in the dilemma between the so-called quantitative approaches and qualitative approaches or quantitative research methods and qualitative research methods. 
but these are not the only two uh, categories of research methods. There are actually four. Uh, we have also mathematical derivation, physical derivation as research methods, and holistic approaches or more or less philosophical research methods. And generative design research methods are mainly in this area. Of course, also utilizing more research methods from other fields, but mainly they are concerned with mathematical derivation and exploration. Just for your information, if you're wondering what is epistemology all about, it's about um, the distinction between facts, social constructs, and opinions, and how we position ourselves and, and our research methods and our field of study in this uh, spectrum. Not everything that counts can be counted, but uh, not everything that can be counted co counts. Okay, so if we're not only talking about facts, but where we are dealing with humans and human factors, we're also dealing with social constructs and even opinions. Okay, so long story short, this was um, uh, a roller coaster of many, many philosophical and very abstract things. But how do we put these theories into practice? Uh, putting theories in practice is actually called praxis. So it's about, uh, in generative design, is actually about analysis, synthesis, and evaluation by means of logical reasoning and, and um, refuting, of course, logical fallacies. If you don't want to bother with anything uh, else that I've put in this presentation, at least I would like you to, to uh, click on this link and read about logical fallacies. It's about critical thinking not being influenced by um, logical mistakes and logical um, yeah, pro, uh, and propaganda, rhetorics, and, and so on. But uh, back to the point, the, the main point of um, generative design is actually about following logics in the sense of um, um, logos from speech and reasoning. In fact, both of them, reasoning as in mathematical reasoning and speech reasoning as in grammar and languages. And in fact, there are the three categories of methods for generative design are coming, in fact, they can be traced back into linguistics or generative grammars, grammatical or syntactic exploration and optimization. And mathematical derivations, uh, logical mathematical derivation methods based on mathematical optimization, and deduction or derivation, mainly following the laws of physics, partial differential equations in particular, and graph theory or game theory combined in serious gaming for systematic navigation and consensus building. So from now on, I'm going to only give you concrete examples to wrap it up. Uh, generative grammars, as I said, is a, a is uh, the, 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 the stem of a lineage of uh, many generative approaches, such as generative grammars and uh, generative um, um, graph grammars and shape grammars in, in, in generative design, um, started by Noam Chomsky and his uh, famous book on generative grammars. Um, this is, um, these are examples from um, courses that I teach on generative design, uh, synt syntactic exploration of possibilities, devising graphs as if you are devising the, the, the meaning or the, the syntax of a space, and putting together a layout following those syntactic rules and coming up with a shape and then even thinking and, and exploring different uh, ways of tessellating these shapes to get the best performance out of these shapes. So th in this case, I'm looking at an, a grammatical exploration of different tessellations, possible tessellations for a um, roof shape, and figuring out the best tessellation, which provides the best uh, structure of performance, or a mathematical derivation method for um, finding out the shape given a, a, an ocean of uh, structural performance, minimal material, uh, minimal use of material and maximal stiffness in this case, which can lead to discovery of shapes instead of designing shapes by hand, you can discover shapes uh, just following the, the mathematical or physical laws, uh, governing laws of uh, structures. Or um, design games, which are kind of combinations of uh, mathematical uh, rules for derivation of shape and also exp uh, grammatical exploration, exploration. So in a design game, you have a set of rules and you let people play and interact with the rule set. And in this case, you are looking at a kind of a domino-like game, which was used to produce this building, but it could have also led into many other types of buildings. You can, you can see a video where 
uh, different possibilities of this uh, uh, game are being shown. Some other examples of um, the so-called rule-based design from uh, courses that I've taught before, uh, in this case, a course in the bachelor's program for uh, designing um, configurations just by following a, a rather simple set of rules and coming up with uh, intricate configurations that correspond to an idea, a syntactic idea of uh, a grammatical idea of functionality or user experience. In this case, which was a manual, more or less manual game, or a completely computerized game, uh, which is all coded in algorithms for deriving a shape step-by-step step from, from the outer envelope uh, doing analysis on noise and sunlight, um, configuration following a, a, a bubble chart uh, inside uh, the space, figuring out all the corridors, massing, uh, circulation patterns, everything put together, and even deriving the final shape of the building, all following logical step-by-step uh, -step instructions. And everything uh, is understandable for humans so they can, they can explain, they can, they can understand it and they can dig into it as much as they want. So to wrap it up, these are a little bit more about uh, um, what we do in generative design. These are courses that we teach about generative design, uh, in which we teach generative design by means of uh, mathematics, special mathematics and algorithm design and programming, um, computational geometry, topology and graph theory in particular. And this is, uh, in a way, uh, the, the practice of what I preach. So these are the, the, the toolkits that uh, we have been developing for generative design. This is the most recent one for uh, topological generative design, um, topogenesis, uh, developed by my colleagues Shervin Azadi and I. Um, and that's it. So. I hope uh, I managed to stay in time. Apologies if I was out of time. No, so maybe... you are one minute earlier, even. And okay. Given <laughs> that we, we took okay. five minutes, you are uh, quite early. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. So let, maybe I can keep the slides on and stop recording, and then yes. give some time for questions.